to be Business 210, Principles of Management with Professor Joan Lane. And it looks like Chapter 3, Changing Environments and Ethics. Okay. Welcome to Chapter 3. Now, if you're viewing the Chapter 3 video, I'm going to have to assume, rightly so, that you have viewed the Chapter 2 video. Chapter 2 is a very detailed video. Now, we tried to keep it more on the surface and just hit the most important things. But I'm going to tell you, Chapters 1 and 2, if you've made it through those two chapters, uh, you've done a lot. That chapter one, we just got a whole big overview of management, levels of management, functions of management, uh, skills of managers, um, areas of management, roles of man. We just went crazy in chapter uh, in chapter one. Chapter two, we got more smarter. We started studying the science of management, and we talked about evidence-based management using evidence-based management. Base what you do on proven stuff. And then we talked about all organizations should be learning organizations. Chapter three, we're gonna talk about the changing environment and ethics. Uh, I try not to do these chapters right now as I'm saying I'm doing these these chapters uh, uh, in August the, the pandemic is still very very much on top of us and everything and I'm trying not to to sway these these chapters too much to the specifics of the pandemic uh, because so many things have changed that we are certainly hopeful that if you know if we practice the the proper mitigating measures uh, masking, uh, social distancing, washing our hands. Uh, I've got my sanitizer right over there. Uh, and as doctors, <laughs> we talked about the body of knowledge. You think the body of knowledge of COVID-19 is growing? Well, I sure hope so, and I know it is. The way they treat COVID patients today is different than they treated them three months ago. They have more effective treatment measures for uh, folks that, that have developed COVID and it's, it's become, you know, it's not asymptomatic. I mean, they're having problems with it. So the body of knowledge is growing and that's a good thing. Plus, uh, uh, you know, some, some type of a vaccine is gonna come before long. And so all those things are gonna bring us back to a more normal existence. Now, I don't know if we'll ever go back to a pure pre-COVID existence. I don't think we will. But I think we'll go back to a more normal existence. So I, as I go through these things, I try to, I'm trying to think ahead to what we'll call a more normal type of environment, the one that we were used to uh, before, before this past March. All right. Businesses, he starts off chapter three, the changing work environment. Has the work environment changed? Even without, you know, the, the COVID thing for the last four months, has our work environment changed? My goodness, yes. Uh, we talked about globalization and diversity and just our culture. I mean, there's changes inevitable, changes ongoing. The only thing that is certain, uh, one of the things I guess I should say that's most certain about business is ongoing change. If you're not willing to change as a business, you're going to go belly up. Okay, so let's talk specifically in chapter three. He talks about stakeholders. Now, I want you to be familiar with what stakeholders are. The people whose interests are affected by an organization's activities. And you know, you just, you stop and think about that for a minute, it's kind of like, yeah, okay. But the stakeholders of a business, it's amazing the numbers of us that are stakeholders of a business if we've never been inside that business. So what, what are you talking about? Okay, let's talk about CenturyLink. 
the largest business uh, here in, uh, in Marshall Parish, one of the largest businesses in Louisiana, nationwide really. Who's affected by, who are stakeholders as it relates to that business? The people whose interests are affected by an organization's activities. Uh, are the employees affected by CenturyLink? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll break that down, non-managerial and managerial, yep. How about owners, are they affected? Well, yeah, well, well, yeah we need that. Um, okay, is government affected? Taxes and everything? Yeah, government's affected. Is the, uh, are the mall and retailers affected here? Yeah, by what people are going out and shopping? Is the, is the real estate industry affected here? How about schools? Are they affected? Yeah. Students, taxes again. Uh, what about eating establishments? Are they affected? Are all people that work there? Yeah. What about banks, financial institutions, people borrowing money? Uh, hmm. What about automobile, pre-owned and new vehicles? You see where I'm coming from? A business, and it doesn't have to be a huge business, even a small business. Businesses affect a lot of people. Stop and th think about this for a minute. If a new business came to town and hired 2,000 people and the average salary was $75,000 a year, would that be good for our area? Goodness, yes. Who would be affected? Well, you could be affected if you ended up going to work for that business, but who else could be affected? Government, retail, uh, uh, automobile, the whole, the whole number. Now, I don't even want to say this, I almost want to whisper, but let's think about this. What if we woke up tomorrow and CenturyLink was gone? They locked the doors and didn't come back. Would that affect a lot of us? Yeah, tremendously. Some of us that have never been into CenturyLink, the fact that they left and made our, our community a much poorer community it would affect us. So anyway, uh, that's the idea. So when you think about stakeholders, it's very broad. Boy, businesses have a huge, huge impact on our economy, on our nation, on our quality of life, on our standard of living, on us individually, on our family, on our friends. It, it's big. Okay, I put a, a chart in here in your handout. And he was talking a little bit about stakeholders. And we've already mentioned the internal stakeholders. Those people that, that are internal. The employees, the owners, and he breaks it out as the board of directors. Board of directors are, are a part of the owners, but he wanted to break it out into, into three. And so I, I guess what I would, would say, you, you, I put it down here for you, the internal stakeholders in a business or employees, the owners, the board of directors. I, I would be familiar with what stakeholders are, and I'd be familiar with <coughs> what, who are the internal stakeholders. Now remember, if you're going to be familiar with something, that doesn't mean you're going to have to define it, or discuss it, or list it, or explain it. If you're going to have to be familiar with something, you're probably going to see it as a true-false, multiple-choice, matching, fill-in-the-blank. By the way, my fill-in-the-blanks always have word banks with them to kind of help. Then you have external stakeholders. And he really talks about two levels of external stakeholders. He talks about those that are in the task environment and those that are in the general environment. Now really what he's saying is this. I see a, I see a, red, a red dry erase marker. Let me see if it actually works. Yeah, well, kind of weak, but it's there. These are the two external stakeholders. These are the stakeholders that are closest to the business because the internal stakeholders, they're in the business, right? So the task environment, this environment definitely affects the internal stakeholders. It definitely affects the business. But at the same time, the business can affect these folks that are within the task environment. You see what I'm saying? The, the, uh, the stakeholders in the task environment affect the business, but the business affect the people in the task environment. 
The general environment, this is an environment where this environment affects the business, but the business has little to no effect on the general environment. It's too broad. Okay, so let's look. Uh, the task environment are those that are, are closest to the business. And those are the ones that, again, they, they, I, I said here, uh, present you with daily tasks to handle. The task environment can bring about things if you're an owner or especially if you're a management are going to bring about things that you have to, to deal with. At the same thing, how you deal with these things are going to affect the members of the task environment. So who's in the, who's in the task environment? Customers. Whoa, are they pretty important? That's truth number one, isn't it? You've got, to, you've, got to, uh, you've got to satisfy the customer. So some, these, are, these are stakeholders that are very close to you. They touch you and you touch them. Competitors. Remember, you've got to have a competitive advantage. Suppliers. Wow. People who supply you with your stuff. What if your supplies get caught, uh, cut off? What if your suppliers go up? It's called, that, that affects your cost, which means if you, don't, if you don't pass that cost on to your customer, it's going to narrow your profit. Uh, distributors, those people that distribute your product. Allies, these are people that you work with. Other companies maybe that you, that you team with. Unions, if you have a union within your organization. Lenders, hey, financial people. I had a person come in and talk to my small business management class uh, when I used to teach that. He said, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, someone who owns and operates a small business, get to know a banker. Become personal friends with your banker. Make sure that you have a good relationship with a banker at a, a local financial institution that you can deal with. Governments, we've talked about certainly how government can uh, <coughs> affect you and you affect them. Interest groups, there are certain interest groups that uh, that, that may be very involved in certain causes that may affect your business. Uh, the media. Can you affect the media? Yep, can the media affect you? Absolutely. So he's just saying, uh, let's just think about stakeholders. Let's just think about the changing environment. All right, now let me take the task environment again for just a second. Do customers' wants and needs change? Uh, do, the, do the diversity of needs, uh, do the diversity of customers change? Yeah. Competitors. Do your competitors change? Make they come out with a new product? You, you kind of see where I'm going here? Your, your suppliers. Make sure you have the product, the quality. What if the quality of the product that you're getting from someone is suffering? Could that be a problem? So what we're, what we're seeing here is the task environment are, are external stakeholders, but you can affect them and they can certainly affect you. I would be familiar with what stakeholders are. I'd be familiar with the internal stakeholders, and I'd be familiar with the stakeholders that are in the task environment. Now, does that mean that you're going to have to list those things? For, no, no. This is just a this is just a be familiar with type of thing. Um, I, I, I've talked. Uh, well, let me at least let me at least mention the general environment. The general environment is the environment that uh, they can affect you, but you really don't have much effect on them. What's in the general fire environment? Economic forces. Wow, what has our economy done in the last few months? Has it affected businesses? Oh my gosh! And his employees. Think of all the stakeholders that have been affected as a result of COVID-19. The technological environment, always, always a changing environment. If you get one generation behind in technology, you may be, may be barely up. Uh, social cultural forces, we've talked about diversity, the changing nation, that sort of thing. Demographic forces, do you know what demographic, I, I, want, I think I want you to be familiar with this. Demographic is the study of people. People's age, the ethnicity, uh, that sort of thing. So demographics is the study of the population, the study of people. Does our changing demographics affect our businesses? Wow, yeah, really does. I'd be familiar with what demographics are. 
uh, and we talked about uh, political, legal, international forces. So anyway, I'd like for you to be familiar with stakeholders, familiar with what the internal stakeholders, familiar with the task environment, and I'd like for you to be familiar with what demographics are because we are continually studying our population because our population is continually changing. Okay, so the importance of stakeholders, really big. Businesses affect stakeholders, yes. Stakeholders affect businesses, yes. Now let's talk about ethics. You want your businesses that you, you uh, deal with to be ethical? Most of us do. Most of us want our businesses to be ethical. Now this is where, if we were in class together, I would ask you how ethical are businesses? What percentage of businesses are ethical? And I usually get in a class, if it's a class of 20 or 30 people, I'll usually get anywhere from 10% to 95%. And your opinion is your opinion. Uh, let me share my opinion with you about businesses and businesses being ethical. <laughs> I think the vast majority of businesses are ethical or try to be ethical. 80 plus percent? That's what I would say. Now you say, why do you say that? Because ethics is good business. Studies have proven that people don't want to do business with businesses that are not ethical. And if people find out businesses are not ethical, they don't do business with them. And they shouldn't. And it causes businesses to lose money or to go belly up. So one reason I think businesses try to be ethical, the majority of them is because they know they need to be to stay in business. And we as individual consumers, we need to reward businesses that are ethical by, by trading with them and staying away from those businesses we feel like are unethical. But here's the, here's the other thing. If I ask the class, how many of y'all in here are ethical? I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I wouldn't ask. That probably wouldn't be an appropriate question. But if I did ask the class, how many of y'all in here consider yourself to be ethical? Most everybody in the class, including me, would raise my hand. Because being ethical is very important to me. Uh, then if I ask you the question, you ever done anything unethical? Mm, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Looking back, I shouldn't have done it. When I did it, I knew I shouldn't do it, but I did it. So, do I think you're an unethical, rotten, dirty, no good, crummy, lousy person? Nope. I think you're a person who tries to be ethical, but sometimes you mess up, just like I do. And I think, I think, personal opinion, don't have to agree with me, I think businesses are that same way. I think most businesses try to be ethical most of the time. But sometimes, for whatever reasons, they mess up. Now, you've got some businesses that are just crummy. You probably don't remember many of these names. Uh, WorldCom, Enron, uh, Arkadelphia, um, there's a couple, two or three others that won't come to me. These are businesses that went belly up and were terribly, terribly, terribly unethical. Probably the poster child for unethical businesses was Enron. Enron used a bunch of hocus pocus accounting to make them, make them look much more profitable, much bigger than, and had much more resources than they did. A lot of people invested in their businesses. A lot of people uh, got very involved with their businesses. And as it turned out, a lot of that was just accounting hocus pocus. And when, and, and when the cards kind of fell, a lot of people lost a lot of money, including a lot of employees who lost life, lifetime retirements and all that kind of stuff. The two people that, that ran Enron uh, were uh, uh, both sentenced to 25 years in prison. I love their defense. Both of them's defense, by the way, was, we had no idea this was happening. Oh my goodness. Our business has been doing things that are unethical? We had no idea. Well, the jury didn't buy that. Convicted them both of 25 years in prison. Uh, so, 
and, and I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but if you look at your handout, there's something called the Surveillance-Oxley Reform Act. I want you to be familiar with the Surveillance-Oxley Reform Act. As a result of some of these really crummy, rotten, no good businesses, which I think are a small percentage, like Enron, uh, <clears throat> the federal government passed legislation. This is being one of the biggest pieces of legislation. Uh, the Sylvain Oxley Reform Act had to do with record keeping. Businesses had to keep accurate records and the chief executive officers had to sign off on the financial statements. So when, when people can, when the CEO said, we had no idea what was going on. Now under Sylvain Oxley said, well you may not have had any idea but you signed off on it that you did. And it also passed some things where company, uh, they couldn't borrow money from the company and had no interest loans and that, you know, proper record keeping and that sort of thing. So if you look at this, Surveillance Oxley Reform Act record keeping and certification, uh, just be familiar with Surveillance Oxley has to do primarily with proper record keeping, signing off on it by top officials, and, and with the idea being to, to keep these folks honest about how they deal with their company and how they represent their company to the public. Okay, jumped ahead, but at least we got it. Ethics. Let's get back to that. We all want companies to be ethical. That's pretty easy. They should be. Could it be, could ethics be something that's kind of difficult for companies, something they have to kind of stay on top of? Yeah. All right, let's, let's look at this. You know, we talked about globalization. Businesses are all over the world. Nike's everywhere. Walmart is everywhere. McDonald's is everywhere. When you look at ethics, are the ethics in Pakistan the same as the ethics in Brazil? that are same as the ethics in Australia, that are same as the ethics in the United States? Most of you are going to say no, and you're right. Uh, in India, Big, Big Macs would not go over well because of their religion and uh, cows, that sort of thing. Okay. So one problem with businesses being ethical <coughs> is that different societies, different nations have different ethics. If you're doing business worldwide, you've got to pay attention to the ethics throughout the world, right? So it's not that easy. Now let me, let me mention this. In 2020, are we as ethical as a nation as we were 20 years ago? Yes or no? Well, I'm not going to answer that. I have my opinion. But here's my question I want to ask you. Have the ethics in the United States changed? Is what ethical is ethical in the United States in 2020? Has that changed from what it was 20, 30, 40 years ago? The answer is yes. So here's things that make ethics difficult for businesses. Number one, different societies have different ethics, and any particular ethics of a society change over time. So ethics is not, okay, here is ethics, and I'm going to nail it down. I'm going to be ethical, nail it down, done. You can't do that. Because if you're a, an international business, if you practice globalization, which so many businesses do, even small businesses with technology, different societies have different ethical standards and the ethical standards of any given society change over time. So businesses have to be, they have to be vigilant in practicing ethics. Okay, ethics. Standard of right or wrong that influence behavior. I guess I should have defined it first, huh? Standard of right and wrong. Do what, the, what we believe is right and what we believe is wrong, does that change over time? Yes. 
Is it different in different nations? Yes. You know, in some nations, it's perfectly okay to bribe public officials. Really? Yeah. That, and that can be counted off your taxes as a business expense. Okay. Just thought I'd throw that in. Okay. Ethics. I want you to be familiar with what ethics are. Standard of right and wrong that influence behavior. Ethical behavior is right. But what's right depends on where you are in the world and where you are in time. Values. When you talk about ethics, you'll usually throw in the word values. What are values? <clears throat> Relatively permanent and deeply held beliefs and attitudes that help determine the person's behavior. <coughs> The values of people determine the ethics of a nation. If every one of us in our nation were rotten, no good, out to just for me, at all costs people, would we be viewed as an ethical nation? Well, no. So the ethics I like the, the, the value, I like to use the term morals as well, but the values of individuals, our beliefs and our attitudes form the ethics of our nation. Now, does that mean that every one of us in the United, St in the United States have the same values and beliefs? Well, the answer to that is no. If you take, I haven't done this for you yet, if you've had me before, you know this is the United States of America. Okay. Over time, and it's changed somewhat, over time in the South, this is the Bible Belt. We know out there in California, all those people are crazy. Now, if you're from California, I'm, I'm just playing. Don't get, don't get upset. Okay. And so what I'm saying is this. Is it possible that even within the USA, we have several different kind of mini cultures within our nation? Well, we really do. Uh, I would think for the majority of our people probably, there are certain values and uh, values, certain beliefs and attitudes that are, that are strong. Don't kill people, things like that. It's still very, very strong. But the values of individuals collectively make up the, the, uh, the ethics of the nation. And when you've got these, these different kind of subcultures within a nation, that's one of the things that brings about the change in ethics over time. All right, so I want you to be familiar with what values are, what ethics are, and I want you to be familiar with what values, values are. Uh, permanent, permanent and deeply held beliefs. Okay, and I've already, I'm looking at my, my beautifully prepared handout. These are pretty reasonable, readable, so I think we're okay. Uh, how can an organization promote ethics? Well, first of all, is it important for an organization to promote ethics? Well, you've already said yes for, for, for several reasons. Uh, one being it, it's good for business. One being it's good for business. Okay. Uh, I just put you a little bit of a word out there. I didn't put you the whole thing, uh, the whole thing. So let me, let, me, let me go off camera for a minute. Let me find I haven't gone. You can still hear me. I'm here. Still here. Hi, I'm back. Okay, I wanted to make sure I got this. I got this right for you. Uh, how can a business promote ethics? Is it is it important? Yes, we've done that. He said there's three or four ways that you can promote ethics within your company. Create a strong ethical climate. Preach and teach 
ethics from the top of the organization down. If, oh by the way, let's say you go to work for a big old organization as a first line supervisor and the people in the top management are pretty unethical people. Are you probably going to have problems? The answer is yes. Because, because with ethics, ethics has a tendency to, to permeate down from the top. How top management, their values, their beliefs and attitude, their ethics pretty much will permeate through the organization. Okay. Number one, create a strong ethical climate. Uh, you want to support ethical behavior. You want to make sure employees understand what ethical behavior is. Number two, screening prospective employees. Hire the type of people that have the values and attitudes that you have. Now, we talked about diversity. I, I, again, I go back to an example I gave you earlier. I am not in favor of you hiring all of your employees to be white males over 55. We've already talked about we like white males over age 55. But you've got to have diversity as far as your, as your your hiring is concerned. But what we're saying here is, when we talk about screening prospective employees, you want to screen and you want to get the kind of diversity in your organization that you need. But within that diversity, you want to, want to be sure that those folks in those, those the diversity that you're hiring do have the values, uh, the attitudes and beliefs that's important to your company. Does that make sense? Diversity is important, but having the right attitudes and beliefs that are at the core of your company is important. Number three, instituting ethics codes and training programs. That's a part, that's it's separate, but it's really a part of the ethical climate. Uh, <coughs> you want to have certain codes that you go by. You want to have training programs, training programs for people to understand what the codes are. What is ethics? What does that mean to our company and how important are ethics to us? Uh, and you know, ethics, ethical things can change sometimes. And so make sure that your employees are up to date on what is considered ethical and unethical. Uh, and so I think I had number four, reward. Number one, create, create a, an ethical climate, uh, screen prospective employees, institute uh, codes and training. Number four, reward. Reward people for ethical behavior. Well, they're supposed to be ethical, I know. They're supposed to work hard, but it's okay to reward them for it. Maybe some kind of way in your, uh, uh, when you evaluate your employees, and you know, you go through an evaluation process, maybe ethical behavior can be a part of your evaluation. And you can, uh, in some ways, that can help you reward those people for being, for being ethical. Uh, what are whistleblowers? I don't know if I, don't know if I, I put that in, in the notes, but if I didn't, I want us to be familiar with what whistleblowers are. Snitches! Most people that rat on other people. Well, we got to look at that differently. If you are a company that believes in ethics, you want your employees to be ethical. Now, you want to deal with your employees ethically. You want to deal with folks outside of your, you want to deal with your, your customers ethically. In other words, you want to be ethical inside, but you want to be ethical in your external operations as well. If this is the sort of thing that, this is the sort of thing that, that you want, then you need to put these practices or you need to, you know, promote ethics. One of the things is this, unethical behavior can be costly to your company. If it's the wrong unethical behavior at the wrong time, and one of those external uh, uh, folks, the media gets a hold of it, it could be devastating to your company. So what are whistleblowers? Whistleblowers are people that report unethical behavior. Don't know if I wrote that down for us here or not, but, we, you know, but even if I didn't, I think we understand and we know what whistleblowers are. Should people be able to report behavior that they feel like is unethical? Yes. Uh, 
There should be a way it can be done. It can be done privately. Now, when it's done, should you thoroughly have someone within your company that's designated to, to investigate it and do all that sort of thing? Yes, you should. Uh, might you even reward a whistleblower if they did something that could, in essence, save your company from some grief? Maybe you should. Maybe you should. Okay. Uh, so that's, that. we've talked about stakeholders. We've talked about ethics. Let's talk about the last thing he, he mentions here uh, in chapter chapter three. Social responsibility. Uh, I want you to be familiar. I want you to be familiar with whistleblowers. I want you to be familiar with how organizations can, can promote ethics and those other things that I mentioned. Social responsibility. Responsibility to take actions that will benefit society as well as the organization. Being socially responsible. Social responsibility. Do you work for a company that's socially responsible? Does your company ever do some type of a, an activity to help people? Does maybe your company participate with uh, United Way? Does your company maybe participate with Food Bank? Uh, does your company sometimes uh, maybe have volunteers that go out and ring the bell for Salvation Army? <clears throat> Social responsibility is giving back. Now, should you as an individual be socially responsible? Here, here's a question I have. Have you ever done something for somebody that you didn't have to do it, but you did it because you, you wanted to do it? You felt like it was the right thing to do. You didn't want anything from it. You didn't want any recognition for it. You just did it because you felt it right, and you felt like you wanted to do it. That's being socially responsible. That's being socially responsible. And I know you've done that, and I've done those sort of things too. Do businesses have that same responsibility? Should businesses be socially responsible too? You know, there are those in the past that felt like all the business should have to do is make a profit. Well, I think in 2020, we don't feel that way. Just as we don't feel like we as individuals should just take care of ourselves, but we also should, should help others and help things that are important to us. Not for the recognition or for the money or the glory, but just because we feel we should do it. We feel like businesses should do that same thing. Should businesses be socially responsible? And the answer is, yeah. Who should they be socially responsible to? Should they be socially responsible to their customers? How are you, how are you socially responsible to your customer? A good product, a quality product, a safe product or service? Being socially responsible. Should you be socially responsible to your employees? Make sure that they have a, a good wage, benefits, safe working conditions, that sort of thing, yeah. Should you be socially responsible to your owners? Yeah. Your owners are, are expecting a profit, and profit is a part of it. So do you, should you be socially responsible to them? And the answer is, you should. Um, and then should you be socially responsible to just your community, to society? Don't burn tires in the back of your place and mess up the environment. <laughs> uh, adopt a school. Do things that are good for your community. Because we know that people reward businesses that are ethical and socially responsible. So look, is your company being ethical and socially responsible because they know it's good for business? Are they being ethical and socially responsible because it's the right thing to do? Or might it be a combination of both? Well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. I hope it's, I hope it's both. I hope they're doing it because they know it's good for business and you want to do things that's good for business. But I also hope they're doing it because they know it's the right thing to do. Okay, I think that's chapter three. Uh, we know what stakeholders are, internal, external, we talked about that, ethics and values, we did that. Even talked a little bit about Sylvain's Oxley Reform Act. 
We talked about how a company can promote ethics, uh, create an ethical environment, screen prospective employees, uh, institute <coughs> ethical codes and training, and reward uh, employees for ethical behavior. Uh, we talked about what a whistleblower was, be familiar with that. We talked about social responsibility. Social responsibility is, uh, is, is important. It's important for us to be socially responsible. It's important for businesses to be socially responsible. That's chapter three. All right. Hey, there were no no's. There's been no no's in chapter two and no no's in chapter three. There's been a number I'll be familiar with. I'm getting ready to sign off on chapter three, take a little break, uh, and I'm gonna come back in a few minutes and knock out chapter four. Now, I'm not sure when you're gonna watch chapter four, but we're kind of moving on in unit one here. I hope we're learning some good stuff. Remember, if you're having any trouble, you're having any problem, uh, communicate with me. Call me, email me, text me. I want to make sure that we are understanding and we're working together. Okay? That'll take care of Chapter 3. I'll see you in Chapter 4. My executive producer, Professor Ryan Pierce, needs a loud noise, so we're going to give it to him. See you in Chapter 4. <laughs>